would like to welcome everyone to the Roxborough Roundtables. My name is Jessica Putman and I am the student coordinator for the tables. Today our topic is, was the bomb necessary? And our host today will be Evan Lane. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, my name is Evan Lane. Uh, today we're discussing what Jessica just told you. I'd like first to introduce my panel, uh, sitting to my right. Is Hillel Levinson. I want just everyone we're going to go around, just give real brief who you are, if you're a student, what your major is, if you're a professor, what your specialty is. Hello? Hi, uh, I'm Hillel Levinson. I'm a professor. Uh, I teach international law, which has evolved into international relations, and this is uh, finished my second year as a professor here at Philadelphia University. Uh, my name is Tom Rubin. I'm a retired physician. Uh, grew up during World War II. My father served in World War II. I served in Vietnam. Also grew up during the Korean War. I'm here as one of uh, Professor Levinson's friends and uh, an observer. There's no such thing as observers. I guarantee you'll be uh, safe. Trust me. <laughs> I'm an observer. <laughs> um, my name is Casey. I'm a sophomore communication student. I'm Christiana. I'm a sophomore communication student as well. My name is Sammy. I'm a communications student and I'm a sophomore. My name is David Rogers. I'm an assistant professor of rhetoric and writing. Uh, my name is Shane. I'm a sophomore communications student. My name is Evan Prince. I'm also a communications major. My name is Fernando Garza. I'm a business management uh, major with a minor in communication. I'm John, a uh, business major with a minor in communications, fourth year. I'm Fahad Robert, I'm a mechanical engineering student. I'm Barbara Kimmelman, I've been a professor here for 27 years, and I'm a historian of science and technology. Hi everyone, I'm Adine Tinsley, I'm a fifth year landscape architecture student. Back uh, 50 years ago, uh, Harry Truman um, made a speech after the first country ever to use an atomic weapon, which was then, they had actually no idea what it would do. Uh, and this is what he said. Um, Having found the bomb, we used it. We have used it against those who attacked us without warning at Pearl Harbor, against those who have starved and beaten and executed American prisoners of war, against those who have abandoned all pretense of obeying international laws of warfare. We have used it in order to shorten the agony of war, in order to save the lives of thousands and thousands of Americans. And that's what he said the day after the bomb was dropped. So not much had transcribed, transpired, other than that happened. Um, shortly thereafter, when Japan did not surrender on August 5th, we dropped another bomb on Nagasaki. They did not immediately surrender. They did not surrender for quite some time afterwards. Eventually, there was a surrender, and we'll talk about that. Um, several hundred thousand people were either killed or seriously maimed as a result of both bombings. Um, many years thereafter, there were dramatic congenital injuries to children, leukemia and people who survived, uh, skin cancer and people who survived. Many thousands more died in the years following related to the radiation that destroyed both cities. But I'd be interested, before we get into whether it was necessary or not, be interested in what you've learned in the past, what ideas that you've had about why the bomb was used and what personal feelings, if any, you had. So I'll start at the end. Your name? Um, this is Evan. Um, I've heard in my previous schooling that there were two bombs dropped and the purpose of those bombs were to end the war and have very few American casualties after that. <clears throat> this is Fernando. Uh, my education has taught me that um, the bombs were an act of um, violence, yes, but necessary violence. So I'm hoping to discuss that further. And just getting back to, to Evan, I should have remembered that name. Um, what were your personal feelings? Because your um, classmate said it was a necessary thing. What did you What did you believe before this uh, discussion? I don't think it was entirely necessary. Um, too many people were killed. Too many innocent civilians were killed. Uh, this is John. Uh, going off what he said, I think the people in power 
at the time, they had a really big decision, and it was a tough one. I think that they made the right decision, in a sense, because it, it did end the war, and you have to trust them, and they were elected officials. So everyone kind of looked to them, and they, they had to find a way to end it, because they couldn't just have so many casualties. Like, John, I appreciate your hope and idealism about our elected officials. I'm, I'm, I'm personally losing hope these days, but thank you for re-inspiring me too. too. And that was Dave Rogers. <laughs> and I just wanted to, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, Fahadur Rubiran, from what I have heard and read uh, about the atomic bomb, uh, I believe if the <coughs> atomic bomb uh, didn't drop, would be, uh, the war is going to be longer than that. Longer than that. So, we're getting so far the four of you are kind of agreeing that it was used to stop the war and to prevent further bloodshed, further violence. I'll keep the professors out of this for, for a second. Okay, yeah. Say uh, my name is Ian Bantroba. I'm a community service coordinator and a sophomore communication student at Philadelphia University. Um, so we did discuss this in one of our classes last semester and we had a lot of interesting topics, especially considering some of the theories and um, ideologies behind dropping the bombs. Uh, one of the most important things that we discussed, we figured that um, was the comparison between the ends and the means um, justifying whether it was necessary to drop bombs, especially <coughs> dropping one immediately after the other. Um, and after some conversation and consensus in our class, we developed a sort of uh, graphic illustration to suggest the, the justification of dropping a bomb. Um, it's similar to a positive parabola, where if a war immediately starts, um, the justification to end the war quickly is usually a lot more preferable. But as the war goes on, this, this immediate um, end of the war, this just like at all end the war immediately with such a large bomb, um, is sort of less justifiable. And then as the war drags on and more casualties are added up and more um, news coverage is, is covered on, on the war, it starts to um, take its toll, I guess, on the, the justification of whether the bomb should be dropped or not. And um, finally, I guess we could make an argument that uh, the bomb was finally justified after so many lives were lost, not just in Japan, but um, across the world as, as so much coverage was given to this event. And, I, and I'll get into this a little bit. We can't get away from one thing. Remember, Truman was a man People in history are just people, no different from anyone here. Uh, they're not icons, they're not statues, they're, they're not anything special, they're just human beings just like you, like your mother, like your father, like your, your, your friends, whatever. Truman was a, a haberdasher, he was not even a lawyer, and he was in government and he said something very interesting. We have used it against those, and he went on to the list of atrocities that the Japanese committed. And they did. Um, they were brutal in their prosecution of the war. Um, just looking at the rape of Nanking, if you guys don't know about that, tens of thousands of, of Chinese women were raped by Japanese soldiers. They had leagues, like baseball leagues, that they actually kept standings on how many rapes each regiment had of Chinese women. That's how bad. Hundreds of thousands of Chinese died. Tens of thousands of American soldiers were starved to death, uh, marching here, marching there, building railroads out of nowhere. They, what they would do, there was uh, the Bataan Death March, was a very famous um, thing that occurred during the war. We were, a lot of our men were captured and forced to march to a prison camp in Bataan with no water and no food. And what the Japanese soldiers would do is drive by with jeeps with their um, rifles that had the knives on them and just cut off soldiers' heads for the sport of it. I mean, this is the way they prosecuted the war. So when Truman said, we have done these to these people, he basically saying, we have done it because they deserved it, and I'm pissed off. And the American public, getting back to your point, was pissed off. And what happened, how many soldiers died and died brutally around the world. So he was angry. People do things out of anger, and that happens a lot. Uh, so I just wanted to have that floating out there because it relates to what you said. Your turn. Um, <laughs> I was in the 
uh, Adim here. I vehemently disagree with the position of the United States uh, dropping the bomb on both uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Right. Yes. Um, for a multi for multiple reasons, but we can get into that later. Okay. Um, we'll skip the professors. You're just observing. It's I'm listening. I'm okay. I'm You'll try. I'll get my ideas. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Um, this is Casey, and personally, I haven't learned about, I mean, I have learned about it recently, but I haven't given that much thought, but I do realize why we did drop the bombs. It's just, I can't really justify the aftermath for so many years, so many people suffered that weren't even, like, related to the war at all. It's just, it's hard for me to understand. Christiana here. Um, I'm always one for the least violent approach. Um, so learning about this when I was in high school, um, I even learned about this in middle school, but I was totally against the bombing. Um, not because they didn't deserve it, but because of the repercussions that were shown afterwards. Uh, um, this is Sammy. I agree with what everyone said. I think there were too many casualties for it to be considered necessary. Uh, this is Shane. Um, as far as I understand it, it was either like the war drags on um, how it was and then American and Japanese soldiers would have had like a lot more casualties than it would have went on for X amount of years. And then, so they decided to drop the bombs, but then on the other side of that, like a lot of innocent people uh, were killed and lives were affected for the rest of their lives because of repercussions of the bomb. So I'm not really sure. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough decision to support or not support. What I like to do is throw a theory and then go to our professors and go back to you guys. Um, what was put out there is, and this is the truth, the Japanese would not surrender. They would not surrender. They would not surrender in battle. They'd rather die in battle than surrender. And the U.S. soldiers would surrender. That's our philosophy. Theirs is a different philosophy. We, to get them to surrender, uh, what was put out there, what I was taught in school, was either we attacked Japan, the mainland, or we used the bomb. And if we attacked Japan, the mainland, the losses to American soldiers would be in the hundreds of thousands. And I don't think that is a very big exaggeration, like how in Okinawa, 50, 60,000 people died in that small island. Imagine if you attacked the mainland, the homeland, <coughs> hundreds of thousands would have died. Millions of Japanese would have died, which is a lot less than died in the bombings. So the point that I was taught was that we had a choice of either attacking the, home, the homeland, the mainland, and losing so many of our own and killing a lot of Japanese. You could have lost two million people by the time this was done, or dropping the bomb and getting them to surrender. So Truman was faced with drop the bomb, a lot less people die, it's a lot easier, and no Americans die. So that, to me, if Simply, that looks like a simple solution. Uh, however, what I had learned since is that the Japanese were ready to surrender before we dropped the bomb, and that we did not take that, those entries of surrender. And as a result, we ignored it and used the bomb anyway. And the reason why this theory says we used the bomb is because A, we were pissed and they deserved it, and I gave you the words of Truman, and two, the Soviets, who were hardly our friends at the time, needed to be shown we weren't going to put up with any nonsense. And if you don't get in line, which they weren't at that time, Moscow's next. So here's a good demonstration. Look at Hiroshima, look at Nagasaki, that's you, Moscow, next. And that's what happened. The Japanese were very willing to surrender as long as we maintain the emperor. They have a different philosophy in their lives. The emperor to them is like Jesus living. He is a direct descendant from the sun god in their religion. He is a religious figure. If you kill the emperor, you kill Japan. It's like cutting off Japan's head and will never survive again. You have killed their god. Regimes, governments come and go. But if you kill the, the emperor, Japan is over. And we had, right from the beginning, that emperor's got to go. They said, 
save the emperor, we'll surrender. We had the documents. Truman knew about this. Was told by his leading advisors, save the emperor, they'll surrender. Truman refused to do that. And as a result, they wouldn't surrender. And guess what happened? The surrender that we actually accepted from Japan. Save the emperor. That's the only reason why they surrendered. We actually altered the grounds of surrender. So before the bombs, it was, we're going to kill the emperor. That's the way it is. We're not going to save the emperor. We dropped two bombs. They still wouldn't, they still wouldn't surrender. They still wouldn't surrender. And then we said, well, we'll save the emperor now. And then they surrendered. So now I drop that bombshell out there. It is a game changer in ways and in not. And that's what I really want to get into discussion. I found it very interesting that none of you knew that. But the Japanese. Go ahead. The Japanese Say people Say never it. heard from the emperor during the entire war. The emperor never spoke to the people. Tojo, the prime minister, was a person doing the talking. Right. I, 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 I would. I beg to disagree with the part that the Japanese were going to surrender. That goes on and on and on and on. But the fact is, the Japanese, the, the emperor never spoke to the people. After Nagasaki, he did speak to the people, and at that time they said, if that's all it takes, we'll keep the emperor, then we'll, we'll let them surrender. It was unconditional surrender by Germany. But they let them keep the emperor, which, a, and I, uh, we lost we killed more Japanese in Tokyo with firebombing than we did in either of the other two atomic bombs. Uh, we also lost a lot of people flying those B-29s in at 5,000 feet and dropping the bombs. you got to remember, guys, I grew up during World War II, as did uh, Professor Levinson. And our dads went off, and they didn't come home until they were either dead or wounded. That's the way it was. Um, if you were a, all of you guys would have been in the fighting age, everyone here. He would have gone into the island, Iwo Jima. We lost 24,000 Marines on Iwo Jima. Not all dead, but when your arms and legs are blown off, it, it makes your life a whole lot different. Um, I'm, I'm talking, though, from someone who w went through that kind of stuff. Um, and you all would have been there. Trust me, you would have been fighting for your country over in a terrible place you didn't want to go. And I think that Truman, what, Truman didn't know about the bomb until Roosevelt died. He knew nothing about it. He knew nothing about it. No, he, he, he got two meetings with Roosevelt before Roosevelt died. He said, the little man across the street. Um, Joseph Stalin knew more about the atomic bomb that the United States had than Truman did when they had the, uh, the conference, was Potsdam Conference? Potsdam. And, and uh, so he knew more about it than Truman did. He faced, suddenly, one day they walk in and they say, we have this Manhattan Project here and we've got a bomb that will take out an entire city. We think. Because Trinity, they hadn't fired the Trinity bomb yet. They didn't know if it was going to Just work. to say, Trinity was the test. Test, test that in that was done on Earth July 16th, yeah. a month before the bombs were dropped. Yeah. And they had no idea the bomb would have, they had no idea what it was. They didn't, it uh, and then they had to take that bomb to Kenyon. And the story of that whole thing is incredible. But anyway, they took the bomb to Tinian and they, they were flying the planes over and over. They didn't know what they were going to do, except for uh, uh, the pilot, um, and the gay's son. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, anyway. Paul Paul, uh, Paul okay. Uh, and, and, but do I think it has? Now, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm coming from a different side. I'm not philosophical. I wouldn't have wanted to have been one of those 17 or 18-year-old Marines who were running out of Marines at the end of World War II. We killed off so many guys in those amphibious landings that 17, 16 year olds, you got it, well, yeah, a little shaky on the birthday, but you're going in. You guys have no idea how bad war is, really. It is awful. You and don't I, want to be there. And I do, I do have to agree with you that if our soldiers attack the mainland, there is they no doubt, there is no doubt it would have been the 100,000s plus. There's no doubt. I think that's, that's an easy thing. But the question is could have all of that been avoided? If we would have accepted giving, letting the emperor live, which we did anyway. We we let, we, Okinawa was terrible. 7,000 sailors died on ships because of kamikazes. You think suicide people, you think about this, let's put it in modern perspective now in the Middle East. Suicide bombers are, you cannot fight them. 
They simply don't care. They're going to get you. And our, the kamikazes killed 7,000 sailors in Okinawa Bay well, in, in a uh, short period. Let me so. pick up, if I can, when, when Evan invited me to participate today, uh, I was trying to figure out how best to put all this together in my mind in order to figure out what I was going to say. And what I tried to do was put myself in the seat of the President of the United States at that time, Harry Truman, and to try to, as lawyers try to do, or at least the symbol of lawyering is the, the, the scales uh, balancing one side against the other. Um, and I did a little homework in order to prepare myself today, and what President Truman had in front of him when he was trying to make the decision was a number of issues. First of all, there was a plan in place to attack the mainland of Japan. It was called Operation Downfall. And there were dates set for that. October 1945, they were going to go in, in and if I mispronounce the names of the Japanese areas, Kyushu. And then in March of 1946, there was going to be Hanshu. Now this all took place well before, the bombing took place well before that. Um, I guess in reading through it, what jumped out at me the, the most was this. As commander in chief, if I know I can save lives of the people that I'm responsible for, and that's the armed forces of the United States, and I don't take advantage of that, I don't want to have to meet the mothers and fathers of those children who were killed over in taking over uh, in, in taking over Japan. With them knowing that I had the opportunity to end it before they had to go there and before they had to die, and 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 they, I don't have an answer for them to be able to say to them, "Yes, I had the bomb. I could have ended it. Your son didn't have to die." on the shores of... But, but I can interrupt, because I think we're agreeing. I don't, I don't think anyone disagrees that we should save American lives, but the issue is this. If we could have accepted no, no, Japan's let, surrender I'm get to before the, that, let why me, didn't we? Let me finish. Okay. Because I think you're misstating what was offered at the time by Japan. First of all, there was no offer that ever came to the United States from Japan at that time official offer from, from, from Japan on any kind of, of surrender. Germany had already surrendered. That war was over and it was an unconditional surrender. What the United States was asking for was an unconditional surrender from Japan. Japan said, and it was well beyond just whether the emperor survived or not, they wanted to be able to surrender and keep everything, including their armies, intact. That's what they were offering. It was much more than just the issue of the emperor, because if that be, if that was the if that was the issue, it was evident that the United States would have agreed to that because of the religious consequences of executing a religious leader, and 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 that would have been would have agreed to. But it was much more extensive what the Japanese had offered, and was totally unacceptable to Truman. So he had on these scales two things. The, the, the slaughter of American military, well in excess of 100,000, some of the estimates were as much as a million would have been killed or maimed in, in, in going to uh, and attacking uh, Japan, or dropping these bombs. Now, the, the issue today, you know, would we do this today? That's a separate issue, and it's very comfortable for us to sit here today and, and, and say, well, hindsight is wonderful, uh, look at all the damage we did. However, put yourself in 1945 in the seat of the President of the United States who has to weigh the loss of all these lives against the, the very horrible thing of dropping the atomic bomb. There was no question it was a horrible thing. Collateral damage was terrible, but he had a decision to make and war is hell. 
I mean, so everybody knows, I mean, the United States has done some bad things, but other countries have done even worse things. Really? <laughs> As an yes. imperialist nation, the United States out outmatches just about every other atrocity known to man, including the two bombs that you're listing. So I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss for how that the Japanese nation was, was supposed to be bombed when this gentleman here states that they've been, been firebombed for months, for weeks prior to, and then on top of that they decide to, to bomb the two of them. I'm, I'm actually at a loss, and I'm losing track of what you're well, saying because you're just rambling. Let's go over to Barbara. Um, I think the gist of, of Evan's point is that while no one is doubting that dropping the bomb did save lives, American lives, Japanese lives, that the reason that this was done, that these bombs were dropped, as opposed to conventional bombs, which could have had the same effect. And actually, you needed more of them, but conventional bombing did as much devastation in Europe and in Japan as these bombs did um, to property and human beings. But that this was meant to be a demonstration to show the Soviet Union what we had. That's where it becomes, we could have absolutely flattened those cities with conventional bombing, possibly with greater danger to the pilots. Um, but, you know, so that is where, you know, that you're dropping a bomb on this population during this war to demonstrate to a ally in this war, but a future potential enemy, that you have this capacity. What I was going to um, bring into the point, and certainly this was Truman's decision to drop the bomb, but another thing we don't entirely grasp without having a you know a special historical insight is the momentum of that Manhattan Project mm -hmm. and the momentum of that technological race and the thought and, and the, the director of the Manhattan Project was neither a scientist nor an engineer, he was a general. I've forgotten his name. Does anyone remember? Leslie Groves. Leslie Groves. And that was, he was the head of it. And he had a fascinating job during the war to manage these scientists and these engineers and get them all working together, theoretical, uh, experimental, you know, all these different guys. And they were on a mission, and the scientists had this opportunity to do research that they never had any opportunity to do before. And the government was spending all kinds of money on scientific research. And the original goal, the scientific work about nuclear energy had all been published already in the 1930s. Scientists everywhere had access to it. The fear was that, the original fear was that Germany, that many of these, there were German scientists who pioneered this nuclear research, that the German scientists would get this bomb, what would this bomb be like in the hands of Germany? Scientists fled, um, Jewish scientists, anti-fascist scientists fled from Europe. They worked on the atomic bomb and the different projects. And on that project, everyone felt the goal was to use this. What are we making it for? Having found the bomb, having found we have it. used it. Yes. And that's the true Well, so, But it's an interesting, I was very interested when you first read that, at the word found, as though someone's wandering around <laughs> in the <laughs> desert. Look what we found. I mean, obviously, this was the intent was to produce this weapon. And the intent all along had been to use it. Germany surrendered before it was ready. It could not have been used on Germany because Germany had surrendered before that. We were still at war with Japan when, um, when it was ready. They tested it. Does anyone remember? They used two bombs. I'm not sure they had a third, or did they? They probably, probably did. did. They probably had three or four, but we, yeah. that's, that's why. Yeah. But, in the history. Yeah, it's, but it's possible that these were the only two. And they used them. And I, I don't think we should underestimate, even though it was Truman's ultimate decision, I'm sure he had advisors, he heard from Groves, no doubt, we've got it, right? How very much that momentum of that drive from that project played into 
But I just want, but I wanted to make one point before we move on, because the scientists, after seeing mm. what it could do, Many. Robert Oppenheimer was the uh, the father. He's the guy who put it together. Mm. He's the man. He saw this, and these are his words uh, from Dante. He said, "I have become death, the destroyer of worlds," and that's the first words he wrote after seeing Trinity, which was the test in July that took place. Um, they wrote a letter, the scientists who worked on the bomb, they wrote a comprehensive letter to Truman saying, please do not use it. These are the guys who made it. So that, that yeah. momentum argument is political, but the scientists had no idea what they were doing as far as how bad it would be. And when they saw it, it was like, oh. So momentum. that was the scientists. I just want to add one thing, we'll go back to it. So you should know this. Potsdam was the big conference that was taking place in July that Truman, our president, was meeting with Stalin, the Russian president, and Churchill, the English president. All the allies were getting together. He put together um, a proposal for Potsdam. And in that proposal was paragraph 12. And in paragraph 12, this is before Trinity. That means we didn't know it worked. Okay? And for all we knew, it wasn't going to work. We had no clue it was going to work. Um, he wrote down that unconditional surrender, they altered the terms in paragraph 12, saying that we will keep the present monarchy, which is save the emperor. Trinity happens. He gets on the, the boat, Truman, along with his uh, secretary of state, and they head to Potsdam. Paragraph 12 has been altered again after Trinity. And the stuff about the monarchy was taken out. So there was a change. Before go before Trinity, the US government policy was to accept, to alter unconditional surrender. This is written down to allow the emperor to live. That was purposely taken out after Trinity work. And we have to understand that that was done for a reason. Let's welcome the students back in this conversation go ahead. a little bit. No, I mean, it seems as though so the question still remains. We have different perspectives of whether it should have been used or not. Knowing this variety of information, like, have your feelings about it changed? I mean, is it justified? I mean, there's a great documentary that actually we might watch in our class, The Fog of War, um, about Robert McNamara. <clears throat> and it actually mainly is about Vietnam, but it traces back to World War II and the use of the atomic bomb. So I'm just curious from what students think since you provided some like educational and right. historical context. And I think it's fair we can have different perspectives on this. So John. Alright, honestly, I feel like I don't know enough. And if I had all the statistics and if I had everything in front of me I could make a better decision, but I kinda take take back what I said before because I'm not I wasn't educated enough to know all the facts of the war. I think that everyone and, and some of the facts that you guys are saying, like they kinda Contradict, so I, I'd really just like to see everything for myself. Well, I mean, let's put. Go ahead, Ian. Then we've done our job because that's exactly what I want you to do. Um, but go ahead, Jay. Well, let's put it in the context of our class too, right? So, so we're in a reading the visual, so it's about visual culture. Think about the ramifications of a bomb, like the hydrogen bomb, being exploded visually. What that symbolizes and suggests to the public. It's not just look at what we'll do to the Soviets. I think it's a worldwide, like, look at what America can do. We are badasses. We have well, about Korea? Yeah. Hmm. I mean, that's, that's as bad as yeah. anything. We won't fire the first bomb. I, I, I can't imagine this country firing the first bomb. Well, about other people who have nuclear weapons. Oh, well, the persistence of, yeah, and the persistence of this is a different, mm -hmm. it's not different, but it's not, I just think that as a text, right, so we have these competing narratives that, existed at the time, and they continue to persist and, you know, um, but Ian has a hand raised in the back. So. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the things I've noticed is that we've been discussing this very inductively, that we've been using a lot of data and um, information to suggest something, rather than to imply that something suggested could lead to data or something like that. We didn't know any of the ramifications of dropping the bomb. We were very our, our understanding of atomic theory today is so 
vast and comprehensive compared to the time when we dropped the bomb. Um, and one of the things that I considered when we discussed this in one of my classes recently was um, whether the U.S. decided to drop this bomb in order to end the war or for the U.S. to win the war. And both of those narratives really have um, different ramifications for them. If we were to drop a bomb in order for us to win the war, um, some could view that more as a publicity stunt or more as a sign of power, especially when we had um, an event leading up to it, which or an event that followed uh, World War II, which would have been the Cold War, of course. Um, we would have, I mean, it's, it's plausible that we would have been in a different situation coming out of World War II had we not won the war. We might not have been seen as America, the almighty superpower, which nowadays we are still considered one of the most powerful nations in the world, especially since our, na our nation's military, I believe it supersedes the next 25 nations in regards to military spending. Okay, so so we can definitely say today that um, our, our military power has still maintained its dominance. Um, but again, with my lack of knowledge of um, statistics and, and plausibilities, um, it could be arguable that um, perhaps not dropping the bomb, we would see different um, results in regards to how the war would have concluded um, had we simply done attrition and um, attacking the mainland of Japan. Uh, my name is Mallory. I'm a marketing major with mine in communications. Um, I guess like to kind of like bring it back to what you said, like the visual text of actually seeing the bomb go off. Um, I don't, my personal opinion is I don't think that's anything to be proud of. I don't think that's, oh, look at America, like we really did good. No, I, I feel like we killed millions of people, and the even just the after effects of radiation towards children and mothers and families, like I don't feel like it's anything to be. Oh yeah, we're like a superpower. Like look at what we did. It's I don't think that's anything to be proud of. I mean, war is I just think is an incredibly negative thing, and either way. Like, I feel like the, end, the outcome would have been negative, but I don't think it's anything to say, oh, look, like, look what America can do. Look what we can do. We've killed millions of people. Okay, so I actually was kind of going towards that when I was waiting to um, respond because I'm more of a want to fight for those who can't really fight for themselves type of person. So I'm more leaning towards compassion. And truthfully, like, when I first learned about the atomic bombs, like, in, like, I think grade school, I think it's when we first started learning about it, um, all the way up until high school, until I actually learned the truth about it, I was like, oh, okay, well, this is something we needed to do, okay. But then after I learned about, like, the side effects, the after effects, the, that, the fact that we tested it a month before bombing, I was like, this is not something we should have done. If there was another way, we could have went about it. And then my thing is, is there was effects on the island, obviously. So within a month, I'm pretty sure they saw that something happened on the island. There was changes, things died, things of that nature. But they didn't even care if they, they even went back to look to see what happened after dropping it. I mean, you've never seen this in action. You, never, you don't even know what it does, per se, besides destroy stuff. So. <laughs> no, I don't want to. I don't want to interrupt you, but I, I have something to say in response to those two. Comments. Okay. Besides, um, destroy things, but you don't know the side effects, the reaction, especially when you're working with something unknown to you that you didn't even decide to go back to the island, see what it did to the island, what was the ramifications, or even if you did, you didn't care about what did happen. So you dropped the bomb, and I think that was just horrible. I mean, there's so many other. There could have been another option. Anywhere, and I understand because I come from a military family, so I understand like the losing the lives because my brother being in Iraq war scared me half to death every night. Seeing anything on the news, I'm like, oh my god, is my brother okay? But at the same time, it's like we ruined these people's lives. Like we didn't just attack military people; we attacked families who had nothing to do with it. We attacked them for generations to come. It's not like we attacked them once with bombs and that was that. They build it back up. Okay. No, we tag every family after that. And I don't know if there's still effects now, but like mm -hmm. if there is, like we're still messing with them. Like we're never they're never gonna get past what we did to them. And it's horrible. 
another defendable theory about why the United States dropped the bomb has been presented by some historians of science. Um, the fact is, although we didn't know what precisely the bomb would do, we knew that a tremendous amount of radiation was going to be released. We knew what other kinds of radiation did. We knew about x-rays. We knew about a variety of other types of radiation and the kinds of impact it had. And um, in fact, when we tested the, the bomb in the United States in the desert, that was a technical test of the bomb itself, but no test really. It did not test what the impact would be when it was dropped from a plane and what impact it would have biologically on the population afterwards. And again, with the Soviet Union in mind and the knowledge that this was not a weapon that the United States would be able to maintain a monopoly on. Everyone knew we wouldn't. The, between spying and the science that was out there, we knew that this was going to be reproducible and that without any question the Soviet Union was going to have this bomb. We wanted to understand what the impact of a dropped bomb would be on populations. What impact it would have, what radiation, and part of the support for that argument is that we sent a group of doctors to Japan under the name of the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission with the instructions to study the impact on people but not to treat the victims. So basically we went in there, bombed them because we just wanted to see what happens. That's an Show our, well, flex our power. I'm telling you that this is an argument country, that has been made. Sent doctors in, yeah. told them not to treat them, and <laughs> use them as test yeah. subjects. I think that is the most cruel thing you could ever do you to just people. Just made this so oh, much worse. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when we have medical studies today going on, and you're in a group of people who have a may or may not have the drug, what's the difference? But you sign right. up for these studies. You know what you're getting yourself involved in. We've right. been really, through policies really and everything that. to, like, we have rules and regulations now that keeps people from being harmed during these different test subjects. I mean, this was just something we just did. I feel like we had no morality when we did something like this. You know what? Personally. Uh, wait. I, just want, I just want to have one thing to – that we're missing a point here. Um, that – I think we have to know before we make moral judgments. Mm. Uh, the Soviet Union at the end of the war, they were our ally up until May or April of that year when the war ended with Germany. We quickly became enemies, very quickly became enemies. Stalin was insane. He was in charge of Russia. I don't think any of us could disagree with that. He had killed 20 million of his own people. Never mind how many lost the war. He killed anyone who was in his way. He is one of the worst genocidal maniacs that exist in our history. And I don't know why that's not taught more. Um, he killed more than Hitler. Does that make an impression? Okay? Stalin was crazy. Stalin also made it very clear at the beginning of the war that he wanted to wait it out where everybody's weak and everyone beats each other up and when everyone is weakened, he's going to move in, and the word he used was Sovietize. And he was going to Sovietize England, France, and all of our Western Europe allies. That was his goal. And to the end of the war, his actions proved that that is indeed what he wanted to do, and was doing that. He took over Poland. I don't want to get into that story, but the, what he did there was outrageous. So it wasn't all words. He actually was deeds. He made it very clear to us that he intended to take over Europe. The United States, there was no left army of any strength. France was restarting, they had no army. England was decimated, Germany of course. The, 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 you know, there was nothing there. The only powerful army in Europe was the Soviets, and they were very powerful and they lived there. Yeah, we were powerful, but our men came home and we couldn't maintain the cost psychologically and economically of having millions of men over there to fight the Soviets. So people say this, and I want you to consider that, that had we not dropped the bomb, 
on, as Truman said, on the people who deserved it being dropped on them, we would have been involved in World War III with the Soviets. And dropping the bomb stopped World War III. And yes, we had a Cold War, I think as you brought out, one of you brought out, but you brought out, but that didn't end up with millions of lives lost, which a third world war would have. So there are historians who say, yes, we could have avoided dropping the bomb by accepting surrender, which we eventually accepted anyway, the same one, from Japan, but that wasn't the point. The point was not to get Japan to surrender, that was point one. Point two, bigger point, was to stop the Soviets from doing what they were doing and end World War III before it began. So if I throw that out, I just want to be absolutely fair to Truman and what was going on at the time. So yeah, you had something uh, to say. This is Shane, and this is just more of a question to like people that know more. Um, they didn't patent want to, want to go right into Russia. Like, do you think that was intimidating and a threat enough to the Russians? Well, Pat was back in America by that time because the war was over in Europe. He wanted to at the end of the German, German surrender when the Soviets and the, when these armies met face to face in Germany, he was inclined to go after them and push them back. Uh, I think, I think we're losing that. sight of, of, of uh, in order to really fully comprehend what what this is all about. We have to, again, understand what is what is in front of President Truman at the time that he made the decision. That, that first of all, we had been at war since 1938, I guess, or when we, 39. 39, we got, so it was, we were at, at war uh, for five years, six years by that time, 41, from Pearl Harbor. Well, okay. Some people are in 39. Um, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm thankful that I've never had to make the decision of sending people to their death in order to defend the United States. But there are people who have had to do that. There are generals in the Army, there, there are military people that do that on a regular basis. War is a horrible, horrible thing on both sides. Sure, the damage that was done as a result of the dropping the two bombs is, is, is horrendous. I, I, I agree. I mean, I'm not saying that, that I'm ig ignorant of, of, the, of the side effects that it had. But the benefit that it had was that on one side, President Truman says, I'm going to lose somewhere between 250 to a million American soldiers if I have to invade the mainland. And I can save those lives if I, I drop the bomb, no matter how horrendous that might be. And we really didn't know the full side effects of it, even though there was some, some sense of that. And there's no question that it was a psychological effect on Japan and Russia by dropping those bombs. All of a sudden, that put a whole different perspective on what the future of, of relationships among the countries is going to be. You know, I'm not going to sit here and, and, and say it was it, it was it was it was fine that, that these people had to die. But don't forget, both Hiroshima and Nagasaki were military bases. Both it was you know you get the picture it was just all innocent civilians. There were two major military bases. There were also major military uh, factories on both of those islands. So it was not just. Uh, I get, sometimes I get the, the picture from some of the comments that this is some um, ideal situation where it was only civilians. They were military targets, and 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 it and it saved American lives. And if a president ever has to be put in a position like that, again, I'm hoping they make the same decision that they're going to save the American lives the best way they possibly. I think with limited time, what I'd like to do is just go around with students again, because you've been given new information, different information. You gave an opinion at the beginning, and I'm just interested in what you've heard, whether you've changed your opinion, or that you want to find out more on what you, uh, how it's affected you. So we'll start again with you, Evan. Um, I just have a question yeah. before I begin. What's the percentage of military personnel to civilians? On the civilians? islands? On the islands, yes. You can't say that. I don't. You know why? Because civilians also are making bullets, bombs, cannons, rifles, everything. I think so there were uh, civilians are civilians are part of the war. Go ahead. 
you know. I believe there there are like twenty thousand twenty thousand people in the army in Hiroshima, I believe. Like twenty thousand And these were not there were military bases in them, but these were cities, functioning cities and manufacturing all kinds of things, whether bullets or, or pie, you know, they they the manufacturing cities. So going back to you. Um, it's hard. Um, I could never be in that position to say whether it's, we should drop a bomb or we shouldn't have. But knowing what we did know about the bombs before we dropped it, the tests on Trinity, um, if we did, if we were offered a surrender by Japan before we did drop the bombs, why not wait to use it on Moscow if something did become of that? Um, that's, that's where I'm at. <clears throat> this is Fernando. Um, this session was informative to me personally more than anything. Uh, on one side, yes, you can justify the dropping of the bombs because you may have saved uh, American lives. <clears throat> but the opinions expressed that on the contrary side of this, um, the, the maybe flexing of the technology or forces that we had um, at the time to prevent future wars or something is maybe more of a political uh, aspect of all this. And, uh, a dramatic moment. <laughs> Go ahead. I have a question first. What percentage of your information would you say is 100% factual? 100%. <laughs> Because I, I, I don't know, I, I, I heard a couple things, I don't want to argue with you, but some of the things that you said, I, I do know about, and it's incorrect. Like what? The military bases. Yeah. There were no military bases? Can, can, no, 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 no. Can you say everything you said? And even, I, other people in the room even had this, this look on their face like, yeah, he's... They yes. were not primarily military targets. Yeah. Most of the military no, targets no, had saying, already never been used the word from, right? damaged by, and that was part of the conundrum of the people making the decision about where to drop the bomb, was that most of the, mili the, the, the purely military targets well, had destroyed. already been destroyed. Um, the, as, as Professor Lane said, who I called Evan before, so I'm being very inconsistent, um, <laughs> There were manufacturing, there were military, there was military manufacturing there. That was not the primary there was purpose no training, of those. There was no training facility. I, I'm, not, there wasn't, I'm not aware there of wasn't that. Troops, was I, there wasn't troops, was there? Because I don't, I I don't know if there was that. troops. Were, were there troops there? Yes. There, yes. Or, was an Air Force base there? Uh, yes. Like you'd have Fort Dix. You know, that, that type of thing. But it's... it's, it's, uh, it's yeah. a big. It's a big area to cover to get those... Yeah, I would search in the future about more opinions about uh, what would have happened if uh, Japanese offered the conditional surrender after the first bomb, not after the second bomb. What would happen? Happen, and what's going to change if that happened? <laughs> My position necessarily hasn't changed that much. Like I understand totally why um, we dropped the bombs because I think it, in some ways it was beneficial because who knows like how long it could have gone on. But also I just I'm not a big fan, obviously, of the repercussions of dropping the bombs, especially like, with the effects of the people and everything on the island. So. Um, this is Christiana. My stance is still essentially the same. Um, I do like what the professor said about um, putting, um, you know, being in the shoes of the president at the time. If I was president, who knows what would be going on right now. But um, that being said, uh, what you said about them coming in and not giving any help to any civilians, but, you know, just taking down notes and whatnot, makes the whole situation a little more serious to me about what their real intentions were with the visual and more like a power aspect. I have a question also. How much did it cost for them to create it? It's more than $2 billion. billion. <laughs> billion. It um, was an enormous project. Yeah. By uh, the time uh, Truman inherited the program, it was more than it was more than $2 billion. In those days, Mike. 
Yeah, yeah. 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 that's a lot. They had to maintain <laughs> numerous types of experimental sites because people didn't know which would be the fastest oh, right. way to create their uranium. You know, yeah. to to so there were multiple sites, multiple research projects in a way that any non-governmental project would never have done because you know. But so they needed to throw a lot of money at this to make it happen. I'm at, I'm at a crossroads. I, really, I learned a lot more than I did than I knew before, so I, I'm really not sure my stance is. Um, Dave, any final comments for the class? Not about this topic necessarily, but I think just to s sort of summarize some of the things that relate to our class. I mean, I think what's exciting about this discussion is it shows us how the complexities of issues mm -hmm. and that that examining as many perspectives and finding as much information and why research matters and why knowing as much as you can matters. But for you calm folks too, like how things are framed, how stories are told has real material power. It's not just symbolic. It actually is material. It manifests in material ways and has um, economic, political, social, cultural consequences. So I think it's, this is, we should continue this conversation. I mean, it's an important one. I don't think we've arrived at, which we weren't, but I think it's a, it, what's exciting is that it opens up all these new questions. It's important to remind ourselves too how powerful emotion works and how feelings aren't something divorced from reason. Like they, they work in concert with each other and shape our ideas and decisions and that we need to interrogate and examine them and, and think through them rather than responding, reacting. I'd like to say, Sorry. And because we're at our time, and the best thing is to always end when it's interesting as opposed to wait until it's not. Um, I think the best thing I'm hearing from all of you is that you're interested in learning more. Uh, and that's the important thing. Uh, this is an extremely important topic. And if you walk out of here going, I want to go and do some research, I want to look into what Professor Levinson said, what I said, um, what Professor Kimmelman and Roger said, and explore beyond it and, and reach your own opinions or even add to it, then that is the point of all of this, and I'm very excited by that. So thank you all for coming. Lots of fun. I really enjoyed it. I just asked one last question. 